Byways of Blessedness by James Allen, published in 1904. Along the highways of Burma, there is placed at regular distances away from the dust of the road and under the cool shade of a group of trees, a small wooden building called a rest house, where the weary traveller may rest a while and allay his thirst and assuage his hunger and fatigue by partaking of the food and water which the kindly inhabitants place there as a religious duty. Along the great highway of life there are such resting places, away from the heat of passion and the dust of disappointment, under the cool and refreshing shade of lowly wisdom, are the humble, unimposing rest-houses of peace, and the little, almost unnoticed byways of blessedness, where alone the weary and footsore can find strength and healing. Nor can these byways be ignored without suffering, Along the great road of life, hurrying and eager to reach some elusive goal, presses the multitude, despising the apparently insignificant rest-houses of true thought, not heeding the narrow little byways of blessed action which they regard as unimportant. And hour by hour men are fainting and falling, and numbers that cannot be counted perish of heart-hunger, heart-thirst, and heart-fatigue. But he who will step aside from the passionate press, and will deign to notice and to enter the byways which are here presented, his dusty feet shall press the incomparable flowers of blessedness, his eyes be gladdened with their beauty, and his mind refreshed with their sweet perfume, rested and sustained, he will escape the fever and the delirium of life, and strong and happy, he will not fall fainting in the dust, nor perish by the way, but will successfully accomplish his journey. Right Beginnings all common things, each day's events, that with the hour begin and end, our pleasures and our discontents, are rounds by which we may ascend. We have not wings we cannot soar, but we have feet to scale and climb. Longfellow For common life its wants and ways would I set forth in beauteous hues. Browning Life is full of beginnings. They are presented every day and every hour to every person. Most beginnings are small and appear trivial and insignificant, but in reality they are the most important things in life. See how in the material world everything proceeds from small beginnings. The mightiest river is at first a rivulet over which the grasshopper could leap. The great flood commences with a few drops of rain. The sturdy oak which has endured the storms of a thousand winters was once an acorn, and the smouldering match, carelessly dropped, may be the means of devastating a whole town by fire. Consider also how in the spiritual world the greatest things proceed from smallest beginnings. A light fancy may be the inception of a wonderful invention or an immortal work of art. A spoken sentence may turn the tide of history. A pure thought entertained may lead to the exercise of a worldwide regenerative power, and a momentary animal impulse may lead to the darkest crime. Have you yet discovered the vast importance of beginnings? Do you really know what is involved in a beginning? Do you know the number of beginnings you are continuously making and realize their full import? If not, come with me for a short time and thoughtfully explore this much ignored byway of blessedness, for blessed it is when wisely resorted to, and much strength and comfort it holds for the understanding mind. A beginning is a cause, and as such it must be followed by an effect or a train of effects and the effect will always be of the same nature as the cause. The nature of an initial impulse will always determine the body of its results. A beginning also presupposes an ending, a consummation, achievement, or goal. A gate leads to a path, and the path leads to some particular destination. So a beginning leads to results, and results lead to a completion. There are right beginnings and wrong beginnings, which are followed by effects of a like nature. You can, by careful thought, avoid wrong beginnings and make right beginnings, and so escape evil results and enjoy good results. There are beginnings over which you have no control and authority. These are without in the universe, in the world of nature around you, and in other people who have the same liberty as yourself. 
Do not concern yourself with these beginnings, but direct your energies and attention to those beginnings over which you have complete control and authority, and which bring about the complicated web of results which compose your life. These beginnings are to be found in the realm of your own thoughts and actions, in your mental attitude under the variety of circumstances through which you pass, in your conduct day by day, in short, in your life as you make it, which is your world of good or ill. In aiming at the life of blessedness, one of the simplest beginnings to be considered and rightly made is that which we all make every day, namely, the beginning of each day's life. How do you begin each day? At what hour do you rise? How do you commence your duties? In what frame of mind do you enter upon the sacred life of a new day? What answer can you give your heart to these important questions? You will find that much happiness or unhappiness follows upon the right or wrong beginning of the day, and that when every day is wisely begun, happy and harmonious sequences will mark its course, and life in its totality will not fall far short of the ideal blessedness. It is a right and strong beginning to the day to rise at an early hour. Even if your worldly duty does not demand it, it is wise to make of it a duty and begin the day strongly by shaking off indolence. How are you to develop strength of will and mind and body if you begin every day by yielding to weakness? Self-indulgence is always followed by unhappiness. People who lie in bed till a late hour are never bright and cheerful and fresh, but are the prey of irritabilities, depressions, debilities, nervous disorders, abnormal fancies, and all unhappy moods. This is the heavy price which they have to pay for their daily indulgence, yet so blinding is the pandering to self that like the drunkard who takes his daily dram in the belief that it is bracing up the nerves which it is all the time shattering, so the liar bed is convinced that long hours of ease are necessary for him as a possible remedy for those very moods and weaknesses and disorders of which his indulgence is the cause. Men and women are totally unaware of the great losses which they entail by this common indulgence. Loss of strength both of mind and body, loss of prosperity, loss of knowledge, and loss of happiness. Begin the day then by rising early. If you have no object in doing so, never mind. Get up and go out for a gentle walk among the beauties of nature, and you will experience a buoyancy, a freshness, and a delight not to say a peace of mind which will amply reward you for your effort. One good effort is followed by another, and when a man begins the day by rising early, even though with no other purpose in view, he will find that the silent early hour is conducive to clearness of mind and calmness of thought, and that his early morning walk is enabling him to become a consecutive thinker, and so to see life and its problems as well as himself and his affairs in a clearer light and so in time he will rise early with the express purpose of preparing and harmonizing his mind to meet any and every difficulty with wisdom and calm strength. There is indeed a spiritual influence in the early morning hour, a divine silence and an inexpressible repose, and he who, purposeful and strong, throws off the mantle of ease and climbs the hills to greet the morning sun, will thereby climb no inconsiderable distance up the hills of blessedness and truth. The right beginning of the day will be followed by cheerfulness at the morning meal, permeating the household with a sunny influence, and the tasks and duties of the day will be undertaken in a strong and confident spirit, and the whole day will be well lived. Then there is a sense in which every day may be regarded as the beginning of a new life, in which one can think act and live newly and in a wiser and better spirit. Every day is a fresh beginning, every morn is the world made new, ye who are weary of sorrow and sinning, here is a beautiful hope for you, a hope for me and a hope for you. Do not dwell upon the sins and mistakes of yesterday so exclusively as to have no energy and mind left for living rightly today, and do not think that the sins of yesterday can prevent you from living purely today. Begin today aright, and, aided by the accumulated experiences of all your past days, live it better than any of your previous days, but you cannot possibly live it better unless you begin it better. 
the character of the whole day depends upon the way it is begun. Another beginning which is of great importance is the beginning of any particular and responsible undertaking. How does a man begin the building of a house? He first secures a plan of the proposed edifice and then proceeds to build according to the plan, scrupulously following it in every detail, beginning with the foundation. Should he neglect the beginning, namely the obtaining of a mathematical plan, his labor would be wasted, and his building, should it reach completion without tumbling to pieces, would be insecure and worthless. The same law holds good in any important work. The right beginning and first essential is a definite mental plan on which to build. Nature will have no slipshod work, no slovenliness, and she annihilates confusion, or rather, confusion is in itself annihilation. Order, definiteness, purpose eternally and universally prevail, and he who in his operations ignores these mathematical elements at once deprives himself of substantiality, completeness, success. Life without a plan, as useless as the moment it began, serves merely as a soil for discontent, to thrive in an encumbrance ere half spent. Let a man start in business without having in his mind a perfectly formed plan to systematically pursue, and he will be incoherent in his efforts and will fail in his business operations. The laws which must be observed in the building of a house also operate in the building up of a business. A definite plan is followed by coherent effort, and coherent effort is followed by well-knit and orderly results, to wit, completeness, perfection, success, happiness. But not only mechanical and commercial enterprise, all undertakings of whatsoever nature come under this law. The author's book, the artist's picture, the orator's speech, the reformer's work, the inventor's machine, the general's campaign, are all carefully planned in the mind before the attempt to actualize them is commenced, and in accordance with the unity, solidarity, and perfection of the original mental plan will be the actual and ultimate success of the undertaking. Successful men, influential men, good men are those who, amongst other things, have learned the value and utilized the power which lies hidden in those obscure beginnings which the foolish man passes by as insignificant. But the most important beginning of all, that upon which application or blessedness inevitably depends, yet is most neglected and least understood, is the inception of thought in the hidden but causal region of the mind. Your whole life is a series of effects having their cause in thought, in your own thought. All conduct is made and molded by thought. All deeds, good or bad, are thoughts made visible. A seed put into the ground is the beginning of a plant or tree. The seed germinates. The plant or tree comes forth into the light and evolves. A thought put into the mind is the beginning of a line of conduct. The thought first sends down its roots into the mind and then pushes forth into the light in the forms of actions or conduct which evolve into character and destiny. Hateful, angry and envious thoughts are wrong beginnings which lead to painful results. Loving, gentle, kind, unselfish and pure thoughts are right beginnings which lead to blissful results. This is so simple, so plain, so absolutely true and yet how neglected, how evaded, and how little understood. The gardener who most carefully studies how, when, and where to put in his seeds obtains the best results and gains the greater horticultural knowledge. The best crops gladden the soul of him who makes the best beginning. The man who most patiently studies how to put into his mind the seeds of strong, wholesome, and charitable thoughts will obtain the best results in life and will gain greater knowledge of truth. The greatest blessedness comes to him who infuses into his mind the purest and noblest thoughts. None but right acts can follow right thoughts, none but a right life can follow right acts, and by living a right life all blessedness is achieved. He who considers the nature and import of his thoughts 
who strives daily to eliminate bad thoughts and supplant them with good, comes at last to see that thoughts are the beginnings of results which affect every fibre of his being, which potently influence every event and circumstance of his life. And when he thus sees, he thinks only right thoughts, chooses to make only those mental beginnings which lead to peace and blessedness. Wrong thoughts are painful in their inception, painful in their growth, and painful in their fruitage. Right thoughts are blissful in their inception, blissful in their growth, and blissful in their fruitage. Many are the right beginnings which a man must discover and adopt on his way to wisdom. But that which is first and last, most important and all-embracing, which is the source and fountain of all abiding happiness, is the right beginning of the mental operations. This implies the steady development of self-control, willpower, steadfastness, strength, purity, gentleness, insight, and comprehension. It leads to the perfecting of life, for he who thinks perfectly has abolished all unhappiness. His every moment is peaceful, his years are rounded with bliss. He has attained to the complete and perfect blessedness. Small Tasks and Duties Wrapped in our nearest duty is the key, which shall unlock for us the heavenly gate. Unveiled, the heavenly vision he shall see, who cometh not too early nor too late, like the star that shines afar, without haste and without rest, let each man wheel with steady sway, round the task that rules the day, and do his best. Goethe As pain and bliss inevitably follow on wrong and right beginnings, so unhappiness and blessedness are inseparably bound up with small tasks and duties. Not that a duty has any power of itself to bestow happiness or the reverse, this is contained in the attitude of the mind which is assumed towards the duty, and everything depends upon the way in which it is approached and done. Not only great happiness, but great power arises from doing little things unselfishly, wisely, and perfectly, for life in its totality is made up of little things. Wisdom inhered in the common details of everyday existence, and when the parts are made perfect, the whole will be without blemish. Everything in the universe is made up of little things, and the perfection of the great is based upon the perfection of the small. If any detail of the universe were imperfect, the whole would be imperfect. If any particle were omitted, the aggregate would cease to be. Without a grain of dust there could be no world, and the world is perfect because the grain of dust is perfect. Neglect of the small is confusion of the great. The snowflake is as perfect as the star, the dewdrop is as symmetrical as the planet, the microbe is not less mathematically proportioned than the man. By laying stone upon stone, plumbing and fitting each with perfect adjustment, the temple at last stands forth in all its architectural beauty. The small precedes the great. The small is not merely the apologetic attendant of the great, it is its master and informing genius. Vain men are ambitious to be great and look about to do some great thing, ignoring and despising the little tasks which call for immediate attention, and in the doing of which there is no vain glory regarding such trivialities as beneath the notice of great men. The fool lacks knowledge because he lacks humility, and, inflated with the thought of self-importance, he aims at impossible things. The great man has become such by the scrupulous and unselfish attention which he has given to small duties. He has become wise and powerful by sacrificing ambition and pride in the doing of those necessary things which evoke no applause and promise no reward. He never sought greatness. He sought faithfulness, unselfishness, integrity, truth, and in finding these in the common round of small tasks and duties, he unconsciously ascended to the level of greatness. The great man knows the vast value that inheres in moments, words, greetings, rest, work, fleeting obligations, in the thousand and one little things which press upon him for attention, briefly, in the common details of life. He sees everything as divinely apportioned, needing only the application of dispassionate thought and action on his part to render life blessed and perfect. He neglects nothing, 
does not hurry, seeks to escape nothing but error and folly, attends to every duty as it is presented to him, and does not postpone and regret. By giving himself unreservedly to his nearest duty, forgetting alike pleasure and pain, he attains to that combined childlike simplicity and unconscious power which is greatness. The advice of Confucius to his disciples, eat at your own table as you would at the table of a king, emphasizes the immeasurable importance of little things, as also does that aphorism of another great teacher, Buddha, if anything is to be done, let a man do it, let him attack it vigorously. To neglect small tasks, or to execute them in a perfunctory or slovenly manner, is a mark of weakness and folly. The giving of one's entire and unselfish attention to every duty in its proper place evolves by a natural growth, higher and ever higher combinations of duties, because it evolves power and develops talent, genius, goodness, character, a man ascends into greatness as naturally and unconsciously as the plant evolves a flower, and in the same manner, by fitting with unabated energy and diligence every effort and detail in its proper place, thus harmonizing his life and character without friction or waste of power. Of the almost innumerable recipes for the development of will power and concentration which are now scattered abroad, one looks almost in vain for any wholesome hint applicable to vital experience. Breathings, postures, visualizings, occult methods are practices as delusive as they are artificial and remote from all that is real and essential in life, while the true path, the path of duty, of earnest and undivided application to one's daily task, along which alone willpower and concentration of thought can be wholesomely and normally developed, remains unknown, untrodden, unexplored even by the elect. All unnatural forcing and straining in order to gain power should be abandoned. There is no way from childhood to manhood but by growth, nor is there any other way from folly to wisdom, from ignorance to knowledge, from weakness to strength. A man must learn how to grow little by little and day after day, by adding thought to thought, effort to effort, deed to deed. It is true the fakir gains some sort of power by his long persistence in postures and mortifications, but it is a power which is bought at a heavy price, and that price is an equal loss of strength in another direction. He is never a strong, useful character, but a mere fantastic specialist in some psychological trick. He is not a developed man, he is a maimed man. True willpower consists in overcoming the irritabilities, follies, rash impulses and moral lapses which accompany the daily life of the individual and which are apt to manifest themselves on every slight provocation and in developing calmness, self-possession and dispassionate action in the press and heat of worldly duties and in the midst of the passionate and unbalanced throng. Anything short of this is not true power, and this can only be developed along the normal pathway of steady growth in executing ever more and more masterfully, unselfishly and perfectly the daily round of legitimate tasks and pressing obligations. The master is not he whose psychological accomplishments, rounded by mystery and wonder, leave him in unguarded moments the prey of irritability, of regret, of peevishness, or other petty folly or vice, but he whose mastery is manifested in fortitude, non-resentment, steadfastness, calmness, and infinite patience. The true master is master of himself. Anything other than this is not mastery, but delusion. The man who sets his whole mind on the doing of each task as it is presented, who puts into it energy and intelligence, shutting all else out from his mind, and striving to do that one thing, no matter how small, completely and perfectly, detaching himself from all reward in his task, that man will every day be acquiring greater command over his mind and will, by ever ascending degrees, become at last a man of power, a master. Put yourself unreservedly into your present task, and so work, so act, so live, that you shall leave each task a finished piece of labor. This is the true way to the acquisition of willpower, concentration of thought, and conservation of energy. 
Look not about for magical formulas, for strained and artificial methods. Every resource is already with you and within you. You have but to learn how wisely to apply yourself in that place which you now occupy. Until this is done, those other and higher places which are waiting for you cannot be taken possession of, cannot be reached. There is no way to strength and wisdom but by acting strongly and wisely in the present moment, and each present moment reveals its own task. The great man, the wise man, does small things greatly regarding nothing as trivial that is necessary. The weak man, the foolish man, does small things carelessly and meanly, hankering the while after, some greater work for which in his neglect and inability in small matters he is ceaselessly advertising his incapacity. The man who least governs himself is always more ambitious to govern others and assume important responsibilities. Whoso neglects a thing which he suspects he ought to do, because it seems too small a thing is deceiving himself, it is not too little but too great for him that he doeth it not. And just as the strong doing of small tasks leads to greater strength, so the doing of those tasks weakly leads to greater weakness. What a man is in his fractional duties, that he is in the aggregate of his character. Weakness is as great a source of suffering as sin and there can be no true blessedness until some measure of strength of character is evolved. The weak man becomes strong by attaching value to little things and doing them accordingly. The strong man becomes weak by falling into looseness and neglect concerning small things, thereby forfeiting his simple wisdom and squandering his energy. Herein we see the beneficent operation of that law of growth which is expressed in the little understood words, to him that hath shall be given, and from him that hath not shall be taken away, even that which he hath. Man instantly gains or loses by every thought he thinks, every word he says, every act he does, and every work to which he puts hand and heart. His character from moment to moment is a graduating quantity to or from which some measure of good is added or subtracted during every moment and the gain or loss is involved, even to absoluteness, in each thought, word, and deed as these follow each other in rapid sequence. He who masters the small becomes the rightful possessor of the great. He who is mastered by the small can achieve no superlative victory. Life is a kind of cooperative trust in which the whole is of the nature of and dependent upon the unit. A successful business, a perfect machine, a glorious temple, or a beautiful character is evolved from the perfect adjustment of a multiplicity of parts. The foolish man thinks that little faults, little indulgences, little sins are of no consequence. He persuades himself that so long as he does not commit flagrant immoralities, he is virtuous and even holy but he is thereby deprived of virtue and holiness, and the world knows him accordingly. It does not reverence, adore, and love him. It passes him by. He is reckoned of no account. His influence is destroyed. The efforts of such a man to make the world virtuous, his exhortations to his fellow men to abandon great vices, are empty of substance and barren of fruitage. The insignificance which he attaches to his small vices permeates his whole character and is the measure of his manhood. He is regarded as an insignificant man. The levity with which he commits his errors and publishes his weakness comes back to him in the form of neglect and loss of influence and respect. He is not sought after, for who will seek to be taught of folly? His work does not prosper, for who will lean upon a reed? His words fall upon deaf ears, for they are void of practice, wisdom, and experience, and who will go after an echo? The wise man, or he who is becoming wise, sees the danger which lurks in those common personal faults which men mostly commit thoughtlessly and with impunity. He also sees the salvation which inheres in the abandonment of those faults, as well as in the practice of virtuous thoughts and acts which the majority disregard as unimportant, and in those quiet but momentous daily conquests over self which are hidden from others' eyes. He who regards his smallest delinquencies as of the gravest nature becomes a saint. 
He sees the far-reaching influence, good or bad, which extends from his every thought and act, and how he himself is made or unmade by the soundness or unsoundness of those innumerable details of conduct which combine to form his character and life, and so he watches, guards, purifies, and perfects himself little by little and step by step. As the ocean is composed of drops, the earth of grains, and the stars of points of light, so is life composed of thoughts and acts. Without these, life would not be. Every man's life, therefore, is what his apparently detached thoughts and acts make it. Their combination is himself. As the year consists of a given number of sequential moments, so a man's character and life consists of a given number of sequential thoughts and deeds, and the finished whole will bear the impress of the parts. Little kindnesses, generosities, and sacrifices make up a kind and generous character. Little renunciations, endurances, and victories over self make up a strong and noble character. The truly honest man is honest in the minutest details of his life. The noble man is noble in every little thing he says and does. It is a fatal delusion with men to think that life is detached from the momentary thought and act, and not to understand that the passing thought and deed is the foundation and substance of life. When this is fully understood, all things are seen as sacred, and every act becomes religious. Truth is wrapped up in infinitesimal details, thoroughness is genius. Possessions vanish and opinions change, and passions hold a fluctuating seat. But, by the storms of circumstance unshaken, and subject neither to eclipse nor wane, duty exists. You do not live your life in the mass. You live it in the fragments, and from these the mass emerges. You can will to live each fragment nobly if you choose, and, this being done, there can be no particle of baseness in the finished whole. The saying, take care of the pence and the pounds will take care of themselves, is seen to be more than worldly wise when applied spiritually, for to take care of the present, passing act, knowing that by so doing the total sum and amount of life and character will be safely preserved, is to be divinely wise. Do not long to do great and laudable things. These will do themselves if you do your present task nobly. Do not chafe at the restrictions and limitations of your present duty, but be nobly unselfish in the doing of it, putting aside discontent, listlessness, and the foolish contemplation of great deeds which lie beyond you, and lo, already the greatness for which you sighed begins to appear. There is no weakness like peevishness. Aspire to the attainment of inward nobility, not outward glory, and begin to attain it where you now are. The irksomeness and sting which you feel to be in your task are in your mind only. Alter your attitude of mind towards it, and at once the crooked path is made straight, the unhappiness is turned into joy. See that your every fleeting moment is strong, pure, and purposeful. Put earnestness and unselfishness into every passing task and duty. Make your every thought, word, and deed sweet and true. Thus learning by practice and experience the inestimable value of the small things of life, you will gather little by little abundant and enduring blessedness. Transcending difficulties and perplexities, man who man would be must rule the empire of himself. In it must be supreme, establishing his throne on vanquished will, quelling the anarchy of hopes and fears, being himself alone, Shelley. Have you missed in your aim? Well, the mark is still shining. Did you faint in the race? Well, take breath for the next. Ella Wheeler Wilcox To suggest that any degree of blessedness may be extracted from difficulties and perplexities will doubtless appear absurd to many, but truth is ever paradoxical, and the curses of the foolish are the blessings of the wise. Difficulties arise in ignorance and weakness, and they call for the attainment of knowledge and the acquisition of the strength. As understanding is acquired by right living, difficulties become fewer, and perplexities gradually fade away like the perishable mists which they are. Your difficulty is not contained primarily in the situation which gave rise to it, 
but in the mental state with which you regard that situation and which you bring to bear upon it. That which is difficult to a child presents no difficulty to the matured mind of the man, and that which to the mind of an unintelligent man is surrounded with perplexity would afford no ground for perplexity to an intelligent man. To the untutored and undeveloped mind of the child how great and apparently insurmountable appear the difficulties which are involved in the learning of some simple lesson. How many anxious and laborious hours and days or even months its solution costs, and frequently how many tears are shed in hopeless contemplation of the unmastered and apparently insurmountable wall of difficulty. Yet the difficulty is in the ignorance of the child only, and its conquest and solution is absolutely necessary for the development of intelligence and for the ultimate welfare, happiness, and usefulness of the child. Even so is it with the difficulties of life with which older children are confronted and which it is imperative for their own growth and development that they should solve and surmount. And each difficulty solved means so much more experience gained, so much more insight and wisdom acquired. It means a valuable lesson learned, with the added gladness and freedom of a task successfully accomplished. What is the real nature of a difficulty? Is it not a situation which is not fully grasped and understood in all its bearings? As such, it calls for the development and exercise of a deeper insight and broader intelligence than has hitherto been exercised. It is an urgent necessity calling forth unused energy and demanding the expression and employment of latent power and hidden resources. It is therefore a good angel, albeit disguised, a friend, a teacher, and when calmly listened to and rightly understood, leads to larger blessedness and higher wisdom. Without difficulties there could be no progress, no unfoldment, no evolution. Universal stagnation would prevail and humanity would perish of ennui. Let a man rejoice when he is confronted with obstacles, for it means that he has reached the end of some particular line of indifference or folly and is now called upon to summon up all his energy and intelligence in order to extricate himself and to find a better way. That the powers within him are crying out for greater freedom, for enlarged exercise and scope. No situation can be difficult of itself. It is the lack of insight into its intricacies and the want of wisdom in dealing with it which give rise to the difficulty. Immeasurable, therefore, is the gain of a difficulty transcended. Difficulties do not spring into existence arbitrarily and accidentally, they have their causes and are called forth by the law of evolution itself, by the growing necessities of the man's being. Herein resides their blessedness. There are ways of conduct which end inevitably in complications and perplexities, and there are ways of conduct which lead, just as inevitably, out of troublesome complexities. Howsoever tightly a man may have bound himself round, he can always unbind himself. Into whatsoever morasses of trouble and trackless wastes of perplexity he may have ignorantly wandered, he can always find his way out again, can always recover the lost highway of uninvolved simplicity, which leads straight and clear to the sunny city of wise and blessed action. But he will never do this by sitting down and weeping in despair, nor by complaining and worrying and aimlessly wishing he were differently situated. His dilemma calls for alertness and logical thought and calm calculation. His position requires that he shall strongly command himself, that he shall think and search and rouse himself to strenuous and unremitting exertion in order to regain himself. Worry and anxiety only serve to heighten the gloom and exaggerate the magnitude of the difficulty. If he will but quietly take himself to task, and retrace in thought the more or less intricate way by which he has come to his present position, he will soon perceive where he made mistakes, will discover those places where he took a false turn, and where a little more thoughtfulness, judgment, economy, or self-denial would have saved him. He will see how, step by step, he has involved himself, and how a riper judgment and clearer wisdom would have enabled him to take an altogether different and truer course. 
Having proceeded thus far and extracted from his past conduct this priceless grain of golden wisdom, his difficulty will already have assumed less impregnable proportions, and he will then be able to bring to bear upon it the searchlight of dispassionate thought, to thoroughly anatomize it, to comprehend it in all its details, and to perceive the relation which those details bear to the motive source of action and conduct within himself. This being done, the difficulty will have ceased, for the straight way out of it will plainly appear, and the man will thus have learned for all time his lesson, will have gained an item of wisdom and a measure of blessedness of which he can never again be deprived. Just as there are ways of ignorance, selfishness, folly, and blindness which end in confusion and perplexity, so there are ways of knowledge, self-denial, wisdom, and insight which lead to pleasant and peaceful consummations. He who knows this will meet difficulties in a courageous spirit, and in overcoming them will evolve truth out of error, bliss out of pain, and peace out of perturbation. No man can be confronted with a difficulty which he has not the strength to meet and subdue. Worry is not merely useless, it is folly, for it defeats that power and intelligence which is otherwise equal to the task. Every difficulty can be overcome if rightly dealt with. Anxiety is therefore unnecessary. The task which cannot be overcome ceases to be a difficulty and becomes an impossibility, and anxiety is still unnecessary, for there is only one way of dealing with an impossibility, namely, to submit to it. The inevitable is the best. And just as domestic, a social and economic difficulties are born of ignorance and lead to riper knowledge, so every religious doubt, every mental perplexity, every heart-beclouding shadow, presages greater spiritual gain, is prophetic of a brighter dawn of intelligence for him on whom it falls. It is a great day in the life of a man, though at the time he knows it not, when bewildering perplexities concerning the mystery of life take possession of his mind, for it signifies that his era of dead indifference, of animal sloth, of mere vegetative happiness, has come to an end, and that henceforth he is to live as an aspiring, self-evolving being. No longer a mere human animal, he will now begin to live as a man, exerting all his mental energies to the solution of life's problems, to the answering of those haunting perplexities which are the sentinels of truth and which stand at the gate and threshold of the temple of wisdom. He it is who, when great trials come, nor seeks nor shuns them, but doth calmly stay. Nor will he ever rest again in selfish ease and listless ignorance, nor sleekly sate himself upon the swine's husks of fleshly pleasures, nor find a hiding place from the ceaseless whisperings of his heart's dark and indefinable interrogatories. The divine within him has awakened, a sleeping god is shaking off the incoherent visions of the night, never again to slumber, never again to rest, until his eyes rest upon the full, broad day. Of truth. It is impossible for such a man to hush for any length of time the call to higher purposes and achievements which is aroused within him, for the awakened faculties of his being will ceaselessly urge him on to the unravelling of his perplexities. For him there is no more peace in sin, no more rest in error, no final refuge but in wisdom. Great will be the blessedness of such a man when, conscious of the ignorance of which his doubts and perplexities are born, and acknowledging and understanding that ignorance, not striving to hide himself from it, he earnestly applies himself to its removal, seeks unremittingly day after day for that pathway of light which shall enable him to dispel all the dark shadows, dissolve his doubts, and find the solution to all his pressing problems. And as a child is glad when it has mastered a lesson long toiled over, just so a man's heart becomes light and free when he has satisfactorily met some worldly difficulty. Even so, but to a far greater degree, is the heart of a man rendered joyous and peaceful when some vital and eternal question which has been long brooded over and grappled with is at last completely answered, and its darkness is forever dispelled. Do not regard your difficulties and perplexities as portentous of ill. By so doing, you will make them ill. 
but regard them as prophetic of good, which indeed they are. Do not persuade yourself that you can evade them. You cannot. Do not try to run away from them. This is impossible, for wherever you go they will still be there with you. But meet them calmly and bravely. Confront them with all the dispassion and dignity which you can command. Weigh up their proportions, analyze them, grasp their details, measure their strength, understand them, attack them, and finally vanquish them. Thus will you develop strength and intelligence. Thus will you enter one of those byways of blessedness which are hidden from the superficial gaze. Burden Dropping This to me is life, that if life be a burden I will join, to make it but the burden of a song. Bailey Have you heard that it was good to gain the day? I also say it is good to fall. Battles are lost in the same spirit in which they are won. Walt Whitman we hear and read much about burden-bearing, but of the better way of burden-dropping very little is heard or known. Yet why should you go about with an oppressive weight at your heart when you might relieve yourself of it and move amongst your fellows heart-free and cheerful? No man carries a load upon his back except to necessarily transfer something from one place to another. He does not saddle his shoulders with a perpetual burden, and then regard himself as a martyr for his pains. And why should you impose upon your mind a useless burden, and then add to its weight the miseries of self-condolence and self-pity? Why not abandon both your load and your misery, and thus add to the gladness of the world by first making yourself glad? No reason can justify and no logic support the ceaseless carrying of a grievous load. As in things material, a load is only undertaken as a necessary means of transference and is never a source of sorrow. So in things spiritual, a burden should only be taken up as a means towards some good and necessary end, which, when attained, the burden is put aside. And the carrying of such a burden, far from being a source of grief, would be a cause for rejoicing. We say that bodily mortifications which some religious ascetics inflict upon themselves are unnecessary and vain, and are the mental mortifications which so many people inflict upon themselves less unnecessary and vain? Where is the burden which should cause unhappiness or sorrow? It does not exist. If a thing is to be done, let it be done cheerfully, and not with inward groanings and lamentations. It is of the highest wisdom to embrace necessity as a friend and guide. It is of the greatest folly to scowl upon necessity as an enemy and to wish or try to overcome or avoid her. We meet our own at every turn, and duties only become oppressive loads when we refuse to recognize and embrace them. He who does any necessary thing in a complaining spirit, hunting the while after unnecessary pleasures, lashes himself with the scorpions of misery and disappointment, and imposes upon himself a doubly weighted burden of weariness and unrest, under which he incessantly groans. I will give my cheerful, unselfish, and undivided attention to the doing of all those things which enter into my compact with life, and though I walk under colossal responsibilities, I shall be unconscious of any troublesome weight or grievous burden. You say a certain thing, a duty, a companionship, or a social obligation, troubles you, is burdensome, and you resign yourself to oppression with the thought, I have entered into this, and will go through with it, but it is a heavy and grievous work. But is the thing really burdensome, or is it your selfishness that is oppressing you? I tell you that that very thing which you regard as so imprisoning a restriction is the first gateway to your emancipation. That work which you regard as a perpetual curse contains for you the actual blessedness which you vainly persuade yourself lies in another and unapproachable direction. All things are mirrors in which you see yourself reflected, and the gloom which you perceive in your work is but a reflection of that mental state which you bring to it. Bring a right, an unselfish state of heart to the thing, and lo, it is at once transformed and becomes a means of strength and blessedness, reflecting back that which you have brought to it. If you bring a scowling face to your looking-glass, will you complain of the glass that it glowers upon you with a deformed visage, or will you put your face right 
and so get back from the reflector a more pleasing countenance. If it is right and necessary that a thing should be done, then the doing of it is good, and it can only become burdensome in wishing not to do it. The selfish wish makes the thing appear evil. If it is neither right nor necessary that a thing should be done, then the doing of it in order to gain some coveted pleasure is folly, which can only lead to burdensome issues. The duty which you shirk is your reproving angel. The pleasure which you race after is your flattering enemy. Foolish man, when will you turn round and be wise? It is the beneficence of the universe that it is everywhere and at all times urging its creatures to wisdom as it demands coherence of its atoms. That folly and selfishness entails suffering in ever-increasing degrees of intensity is preservative and good, for agony is the enemy of apathy and the herald of wisdom. What is painful? What is grievous? What is burdensome? Passion is painful. Folly is grievous. Selfishness is burdensome. Eliminate passion, folly and selfishness from your mind and conduct, and you will eliminate suffering from your life. Burden dropping consists in abandoning the inward selfishness and putting pure love in its place. Go to your task with love in your heart and you will go to it light-hearted and cheerful. The mind, through ignorance, creates its own burdens and inflicts its own punishments. No one is doomed to carry any load. Sorrow is not arbitrarily imposed. These things are self-made. Reason is the rightful monarch of the mind, and anarchy reigns in his spiritual kingdom when his throne is usurped by passion. When love of pleasure is to the fore, heaviness and anguish compose the rear. You are free to choose, even if you are bound by passion and feel helpless, you have bound yourself and are not helpless. Where you have bound, you can unbind. You have come to your present state by degrees, and you can recover yourself by degrees, can reinstate reason and dethrone passion. The time to avoid evil is before pleasure is embraced, but once embraced, its train of consequences should teach you wisdom. The time to decide is before responsibilities are adopted, but once adopted, all selfish considerations with their attendant grumblings, whinings, and complainings should be religiously excluded from the heart. Responsibilities lose their weight when carried lovingly and wisely. What heavy burden is a man weighted with which is not made heavier and more unendurable by weak thoughts of selfish desires? If your circumstances are trying, it is because you need them and can evolve the strength to meet them. They are trying because there is some weak spot within you, and they will continue to be trying until that spot is eradicated. Be glad that you have the opportunity of becoming stronger and wiser. No circumstances can be trying to wisdom, nothing can weary love. Stop brooding over your own trying circumstances and contemplate the lives of some of those about you. Here is a woman with a large family who has to make ends meet on a pound a week. She performs all her domestic duties, down to the washing, finds time to attend on sick neighbours, and manages to keep entirely out of the two common quagmires, debt and despondency. She is cheerful from morning to night, and never complains of her trying circumstances. She is perennially cheerful because she is unselfish. She is happy in the thought that she is the means of happiness to others. She is perennially cheerful because she is unselfish. She is happy in the thought that she is the means of happiness to others. Were she to brood upon the holidays, the pretty baubles, the lazy hours of which she is deprived, of the plays she cannot see, the music she cannot hear, the books she cannot read, the parties she cannot attend, the good she might do, the friendships she is debarred from forming, of the many pleasures which might only be hers if her circumstances were more favourable. If she brooded thus, what a miserable creature she would be! How unbearably laborious her work would become, how every little domestic duty would hang like a millstone about her neck, dragging her down to the grave which, unless she altered her state of mind, she would quickly reach, killed by selfishness. But not living in vain desires for herself, she is relieved of all burdens and is happy. Cheerfulness and unselfishness are sworn friends. Love knows no heavy toil.
Here is another woman with a private income which is more than sufficient, combined with leisure and luxury, yet because she is called upon to forfeit a portion of her time, pleasure and money to discharge some obligation which she wishes to be rid of and which should be to her a work of loving service, or fostering in her heart some ungratified desire, she is perpetually discontented and unhappy and complains of trying circumstances. Discontent and selfishness are inseparable companions. Self-love knows no joyful labor. Of the two sets of circumstances above depicted, and life is crowded with such contrasted instances, which are the trying conditions? Is it not true that neither of them are trying, and that both are blessed or unblessed in accordance with the measure of love or selfishness which is infused into them? is not the root of the whole matter in the mind of the individual and not in the circumstance. When a man who has recently taken up the study of some branch of theology, religion or occultism says, if I had not burdened myself with a wife and family, I could have done a great work, and had I known years ago what I know now, I would never have married. I know that that man has not yet found the commonest and broadest way of wisdom for there is no greater folly than regret, and that he is incapable of the great work which he is so ambitious to perform. If a man has such deep love for his fellow men that he is anxious to do a great work for humanity, he will manifest that surpassing love always and in the place where he now is. His home will be filled with it, and the beauty and sweetness and peace of his unselfish love will follow wherever he goes, making happy those about him and transmuting all things into good. The love that goes abroad to air itself and is undiscoverable at home is not love. It is vanity. Have I not seen, O pitiful sight, the cheerless home and neglected children of the misguided missioner and religionist, it is on such self-delusion as this that self-pity and self-martyrdom ever wait, and its self-inflicted misery is regarded by the deluded one as a holy and religious burden, which he or she is called upon to bear. Only a great man can do a great work, and he will be great wherever he is, and will do his noble work under whatsoever conditions he may find himself when he has unfolded and revealed that work. Thou who art so anxious to work for humanity, to help thy fellow men begin that work at home, help thyself, thy neighbor, thy wife, thy child. Do not be deluded, until thou doest with utmost faithfulness, the nearer and the lesser thou canst not do the farther and greater. If a man has lived many years of his life in lust and selfish pleasure, it is in the order of things that his accumulated errors should at last weigh heavily upon him, as until they are thus brought home to him, he will not abandon them, will not exert himself to find a better life. But whilst he regards his self-made, self-imposed burdens as holy crosses imposed upon him by the Supreme, or as marks of superior virtue, or as loads which fate, circumstances, or other people have heaped undeservedly and unjustly upon him, he is but lengthening out his folly, increasing the weight of his burdens, and multiplying his pains and sorrows. Only when such a man wakes up to the truth that his burdens are of his own making, that they are the accumulated effects of his own acts, will he cease from unmanly self-pity and find the better way of burden-dropping. Only when he opens his eyes to see that his every thought and act is another brick, another stone, built into the temple of his life, will he develop the insight which will enable him to recognize his own unstable handiwork, the unflinching manliness to acknowledge it, and the courage to build more nobly and enduringly. Painful burdens are necessary, but only so long as we lack love and wisdom. The temple of blessedness lies beyond the outer courts of suffering and humiliation, and to reach it the pilgrim must pass through the outer courts. For a time he will linger in the outer, but only so long as through his own imperfect understanding he mistakes it for the inner. 
while he pities himself and confounds suffering with holiness, he will remain in suffering. But when, casting off the last unholy rag of self-pity, he perceives that suffering is a means and not an end, that it is a state self-originated and self-propagated, then, converted and right-minded, he will rapidly pass through the outer courts and reach the inner abode of peace. Suffering does not originate in the perfect, but in the imperfect. It does not mark the complete, but the incomplete. It can therefore be transcended. Its self-born cause can be found, investigated, comprehended, and forever removed. It is true, therefore, that we must pass through agony to rest, through loneliness to peace. But let the sufferer not forget that it is a passing through, that the agony is a gateway and not a habitation, that the loneliness is a pathway and not a destination, and that a little farther on he will come to the painless and blissful repose. Little by little is a burden accumulated, imperceptibly and by degrees is its weight increased. A thoughtless impulse, a gross self-indulgence, a blind passion yielded to and gratified again and again, an impure thought fostered, a cruel word uttered, a foolish thing done time after time, and at last the gathered weight of many follies becomes oppressive. At first, and for a time, the weight is not felt, but it is being added to day after day, and the time comes when the accumulated burden is felt in all its galling weight, when the bitter fruits of selfishness are gathered and the heart is troubled with the weariness of life. When this period arrives, let the sufferer look to himself. Let him search for the blessed way of burden dropping, finding which he will find wisdom to live better, purity to live sweeter, love to live nobler, will find in the reversal of that conduct by which his burdens were accumulated, light-hearted nights and days, cheerful action and unclouded joy. Hidden Sacrifices What need hath man of Eden past or paradise to come, when heaven is round us and within ourselves? Lowliness is the base of every virtue. Who goes the lowest builds, doubt not, the safest. Bailey Truth is within ourselves. It takes no rise from outward things, whate'er you may believe. Browning it is one of the paradoxes of truth that we gain by giving up, we lose by greedily grasping. Every gain in virtue necessitates some loss in vice, every accession of holiness means some selfish pleasure yielded up, and every forward step on the path of truth demands the forfeit of some self-assertive error. He who would be clothed in new garments must first cast away the old, and he who would find the true must sacrifice the false, the gardener digs in the weeds in order that they may feed, with their decay, the plants which are good for food, and the tree of wisdom can only flourish on the compost of uprooted follies. Growth, gain, necessitate sacrifice, loss. The true life, the blessed life, the life that is not tormented with passions and pains, is reached only through sacrifice, not necessarily the sacrifice of outward things, but the sacrifice of the inward errors and defilements, for it is these and these only which bring misery into life. It is not the good and true that needs to be sacrificed, but the evil and false. Therefore all sacrifice is ultimately gain, and there is no essential loss. Yet at first the loss seems great, and the sacrifice is painful. But this is because of the self-delusion and spiritual blindness which always accompany selfishness, and pain must always accompany the cutting away of some selfish portion of one's nature. When the drunkard resolves to sacrifice his lust for strong drink, he passes through a period of great suffering, and he feels that he is forfeiting a great pleasure. But when his victory is complete, when the lust is dead and his mind is calm and sober, then he knows that he has gained incalculably by the giving up of his selfish animal pleasure. What he has lost was evil and false and not worth keeping, nay, its keeping entailed continual misery, but what he has gained in character, in self-control, in soberness, had greater peace of mind, is good and true, and it was necessary that he should acquire it. So it is with all true sacrifice. It is at first, and until it is completed, painful, and this is why men shrink from it. 
they cannot see any purpose in abstaining from and overcoming selfish gratification. It seems to them like losing so much that is sweet, seems to them like courting misery and giving up all happiness and pleasure, and this must be so, for if a man could know that by giving up his particular forms of selfishness his gain in happiness would be immeasurably greater, unselfishness, which is now so difficult of attainment, would then be rendered infinitely more difficult of achievement, for his desire for the greater gain, his selfishness, would thereby be greatly intensified. No man can become unselfish and thereby arrive at the highest bliss until he is willing to lose, looking for neither gain nor reward. It is this state of mind which constitutes unselfishness. A man must be willing to humbly sacrifice his selfish habits and practices because they are untrue and unworthy, and for the happiness of those about him, without expecting any reward or looking for any good to accrue to himself. Nay, he must be prepared to lose for himself, to forfeit pleasure and happiness, even life itself, if by so doing he can make the world more beautiful and happy. But does he lose? Does the miser lose when he gives up his lust for gold? Does the thief lose when he abandons stealing? Does the libertine lose when he sacrifices his unworthy pleasures? No man loses by the sacrifice of self or some portion of self. Nevertheless, he thinks he will lose by so doing. And because he so thinks he suffers, and this is where the sacrifice comes in, this is where he gains by losing. All true sacrifice is within. It is spiritual and hidden and is prompted by deep humility of heart. Nothing but the sacrifice of self can avail, and to this must all men come sooner or later during their spiritual evolution. But in what does this self-abnegation consist? How is it practiced? Where is it sought and found? It consists in overcoming the daily proneness to selfish thoughts and acts. It is practiced in our common intercourse with others, and it is found in the hour of tumult and temptation. There are hidden sacrifices of the heart, which are infinitely blessed both to him that makes them and those for whom they are made, albeit their making costs much effort and some pain. Men are anxious to do some great thing, to perform some great sacrifice which lies beyond the necessities of their experience, while all the time perhaps they are neglecting the one thing needful, are blind to that sacrifice which by its very nearness is rendered imperative. Where lurks your besetting sin? Where lies your weakness? Where does temptation assail you most strongly? There shall you make your first sacrifice, and shall find thereby the way unto your peace. Perhaps it is anger or unkindness. Are you prepared to sacrifice the angry impulse and word, the unkind thought and deed? Are you prepared to silently endure abuse, attack, accusation and unkindness, refusing to pay back these in their own coin? Nay, more, are you prepared to give in return for these dark follies, kindness and loving protection? If so, then you are ready to make those hidden sacrifices which lead to beatific bliss. If you are given to anger or unkindness, offer it up. These hard, cruel, and wrong conditions of mind never brought you any good. They can never bring you anything but unrest, misery, and spiritual blindness. Nor can they ever bring to others anything but unhappiness. Perhaps you will say, but he was unkind to me first, he treated me unjustly. Perhaps so, but what a poor excuse is this, what an unmanly and ineffectual refuge. For if his unkindness toward you is so wrong and hurtful, yours to him must be equally so. Because another is unkind to you is no justification of your own unkindness, but is rather a call for the exercise of great kindness on your part. Can the pouring in of more water prevent a flood? Neither can unkindness lessen unkindness. Can fire quench fire? Neither can anger overcome anger. Offer up all unkindness, all anger. It takes two to make a quarrel. Don't be the other one. If one is angry or unkind to you, try to find out where you have acted wrongly, and whether you have acted wrongly or not, do not throw back the angry word or unkind act. Remain silent, self-contained and kindly disposed, and learn, by continual effort in right doing, to have compassion upon the wrongdoer. Perhaps you are habitually impatient and irritable. Know then, 
the hidden sacrifice which it is needful that you should make. Give up your impatience, overcome it there where it is wont to assert itself. Resolve that you will yield no longer to its tyrannical sway, but will conquer it and cast it out. It is not worth keeping a single hour, nor would it dominate you for another moment if you were not laboring under the delusion that the follies and perversities of others render impatience on your part necessary. Whatever others may do or say, even though they may mock and taunt you, impatience is not only unnecessary, it can never do any other than aggravate the evil which it seeks to remove. Calm, strong, and deliberate action can accomplish much, but impatience and its accompanying irritability are always indications of weakness and inefficiency. And what do they bestow upon you? Do they bestow rest, peace, happiness, or bring these to those about you? Do they not rather make you and those about you wretched? But though your impatience may hurt others, it certainly hurts and wounds and impoverishes yourself most of all. Nor can the impatient man know aught of true blessedness, for he is a continual source of trouble and unrest to himself. The calm beauty and perpetual sweetness of patience are unknown to him, and peace cannot draw near to soothe and comfort him. There is no blessedness anywhere until impatience is sacrificed, and its sacrifice means the development of endurance, the practice of forbearance, and the creation of a new and gentler habit of mind. When impatience and irritability are entirely put away, are finally offered up on the altar of unselfishness, then is realized and enjoyed the blessedness of a strong, quiet, and peaceful mind. Each hour we think of others more than self, that hour we live again, and every lowly sacrifice we make for others' good shall make life more than self, and open the windows of thy soul to light from higher spheres, so hail thy lot with lot with joy. Then there are little selfish indulgences, some of which appear harmless and are commonly fostered, but no selfish indulgence can be harmless, and men and women do not know what they lose by repeatedly and habitually succumbing to effeminate and selfish gratifications. If the God in man is to rise strong and triumphant, the beast in man must perish. The pandering to the animal nature, even when it appears innocent and seems sweet, leads away from truth and blessedness. Each time you give way to the animal within you and feed and gratify him, he waxes stronger and more rebellious and takes firmer possession of your mind, which should be in the keeping of truth. Not until a man has sacrificed some apparently trivial indulgence does he discover what strength, what joy, what poise of character and holy influence he has all along been losing by that gratification. Not until a man sacrifices his hankering for pleasure does he enter into the fullness of abiding joy. By his personal indulgences a man demeans himself, forfeits self-respect to the extent and frequency of his indulgence, and deprives himself of exemplary influence and the power to accomplish lasting good in his work in the world. He also, by allowing himself to be led by blind desire, increases his mental blindness and fails of that ultimate clearness of vision, that clarified percipience which pierces to the heart of things and comprehends the real and the true. Animal indulgence is alien to the perception of truth. By the sacrifice of his indulgences, man rises above confusion and doubt and arrives at the possession of insight and surety. Sacrifice your cherished and coveted indulgence. Fix your mind on something higher, nobler and more enduring than ephemeral pleasure. Live superior to the craving for sense excitement, and you will live neither vainly nor uncertainly. Very far-reaching in its effect upon others, and rich with the revelations of truth for him who makes it, is the sacrifice of self-assertion, the giving up of all interference with the lives, views, or religion of other people, substituting for it an understanding, love, and sympathy. Self-assertion or opinionativeness is a form of egotism or selfishness most generally found in connection with intellectualism and dialectical skill. It is blindly presumptive and uncharitable, and, more often than not, is regarded as a virtue. But when once the mind has opened to perceive the way of gentleness and self-sacrificing love, 
then the ignorance, deformity and painful nature of self-assertion become apparent. The victim of self-assertion, setting up his own opinions as the standard of right and the measure of judgment, regards all those as wrong whose lives and opinions run counter to his own, and, being eager to put others right, is thereby prevented from putting himself right. His attitude of mind brings about him opposition and contradiction from people who are anxious to put him right, and this wounds his vanity and makes him miserable, so that he lives in an almost continual fever of unhappy, resentful, and uncharitable thoughts. There can be no peace for such a man, no true knowledge, and no advancement, until he sacrifices his desire to bend others to his own way of thinking and acting. Nor can he understand the hearts of others, and enter lovingly into their strivings and aspirations. His mind is cramped and embittered, and he is shut out from all sweet sympathy and spiritual communion. He who sacrifices the spirit of self-assertion, who in his daily contact with others put aside his prejudices and opinions, and strives both to learn from others and to understand them as they are, who allows to others perfect liberty, such as he exercises himself, to choose their own opinions, their own way in life. Such a man will acquire a deeper insight, a broader charity, and a richer bliss than he has hitherto experienced, and will strike a byway of blessedness from which he has formerly shut out. Then there is the sacrifice of greed and all greedy thoughts, the willingness that others should possess rather than we, the not coveting of things for ourselves, but rejoicing that they are possessed and enjoyed by others, that they bring happiness to others, the ceasing to claim one's own, and the giving up to others unselfishly and without malice, that which they exact. This attitude of mind is a source of deep peace and great spiritual strength. It is the sacrifice of self-interest. Material possessions are temporary, and in this sense we cannot truly call them our own, they are merely in our keeping for a short time, but spiritual possessions are eternal and must ever remain with us. Unselfishness is a spiritual possession which is only secured by ceasing to covet material possessions and enjoyments, by ceasing to regard things as for our own special and exclusive pleasure, and by our readiness to yield them up for the good of others. The unselfish man, even though he finds himself involved in riches, stands aloof in his mind from the idea of exclusive possession, and so escapes the bitterness and fear and anxiety which ever accompany the covetous spirit. He does not regard any of his outward accretions as being too valuable to lose, but he regards the virtue of unselfishness as being too valuable to the world, to suffering humanity, to lose or cast away. And who is the blessed man? He who is ever hankering after more possessions, thinking only of the personal pleasure he can get out of them, or he who is ever ready to give up what he has for the good and happiness of others? By greed happiness is destroyed, by not greed happiness is restored. Another hidden sacrifice, one of great spiritual beauty and of powerful efficacy in the healing of human sorrows, is the sacrifice of hatred, the giving up of all bitter thoughts against others, of all malice, dislike and resentment. Bitter thoughts and blessedness cannot dwell together. Hatred is a fierce fire that scorches up in the heart of him who harbors it, all the sweet flowers of peace and happiness, and makes a hell of every place where it comes. Hatred has many names and many forms, but only one essence, namely, burning thoughts of resentment against others. It is sometimes by its blind votaries called by the name of religion, causing them to attack, slander and persecute each other because they will not accept each other's views of life and death, thus filling the earth with miseries and tears. All resentment, dislike, ill-thinking and ill-speaking of others is hatred, and where there is hatred there is always unhappiness. No one has conquered hatred while thoughts of resentment towards others spring up in his mind. This sacrifice is not complete until a man can think kindly of those who try to do him wrong. Yet it must be made before true blessedness can be realized and known. Beyond the hard, cruel, steely gates of hatred waits the divine angel of love, 
ready to reveal herself to him who will subdue and sacrifice his hateful thoughts and conduct him to his peace. Whatever others may say of you, whatever they may do to you, never take offense. Do not return hatred with hatred. If another hates you, perhaps you have, consciously or unconsciously, failed somewhere in your conduct, or there may be some misunderstanding which the exercise of a little gentleness and reason may remove, but under all circumstances, Father, forgive them, is infinitely better, sweeter, and nobler than, I will have nothing more to do with them. Hatred is so small and poor, so blind and wretched. Love is so great and rich, so far-seeing and blissful. Sacrifice all hatred, slay it upon the holy altar of, of devotion, devotion to others. Think no more of any injury to your own petty self, but see to it that henceforth you injure and wound no other. Open the floodgates of your heart for the inpouring of that sweet, great, beautiful love, which embraces all with strong yet tender thoughts of protection and peace, leaving not one, nay, not even he who hates or despises or slanders you out in the cold. Then there is the hidden sacrifice of impure desires, of weak self-pity and degrading self-praise, of vanity and pride, for these are unblessed attitudes of mind, deformities of heart. He who makes them one by one gradually subduing and overcoming them will, according to the measure of his success, rise above weakness and suffering and sorrow, and will comprehend and enjoy the perfect and imperishable blessedness. Now, all these hidden sacrifices which are here mentioned are pure, humble heart offerings. They are made within, are offered up on the sacred, lonely, unseen altar of one's own heart. Not one of them can be made until the fault is first silently acknowledged and confessed. No man can sacrifice an error until he first of all confess to himself, I am in error, when, yielding it up, he will perceive and receive the truth which his error formerly obscured. The kingdom of heaven cometh not by observation, and the silent sacrifice of self for the good of others, the daily giving up of one's egotistic tendencies, is not seen and rewarded of men, and brings no loud blazon of popularity and praise. It is hidden away from the eyes of all the world, nay, even from the gaze of those who are nearest to you, for no eyes of flesh can perceive its spiritual beauty. But think not that because it is unperceived, it is therefore futile. Its blissful radiance is enjoyed by you, and its power for good over others is great and far-reaching, for though they cannot see it, nor perhaps understand it, yet they are unconsciously influenced by it. They will not know what silent battles you are fighting, what eternal victories over self you are achieving, but they will feel your altered attitude, your new mind, wrought of the fabric of love and loving thoughts, and will share somewhat in its happiness and bliss. They will know nothing of the frequent fierceness of the fight you are waging, of the wounds you receive and the healing balm you apply, of the anguish and the after-peace. But they will know that you have grown sweeter and gentler, stronger and more silently self-reliant, more patient and pure, and that they are rested and helped by your presence. What rewards can compare with this? Beside the fragrant offices of love, the praises of men are gross and fulsome, and in the pure flame of a selfless heart, the flatteries of the world are turned to ashes. Love is its own reward, its own joy, its own satisfaction. It is the final refuge and resting place of passion-tortured souls. The sacrifice of self and the acquisition of the supreme knowledge and bliss which it confers is not accomplished by one great and glorious act, but by a series of lesser and successive sacrifices in the ordinary life of the world, by a succession of steps in the daily conquest of truth over selfishness. He who each day accomplishes some victory over himself, who subdues and puts behind him some unkind thought, some impure desire, some tendency to sin, is every day growing stronger, purer, and wiser, and every dawn finds him nearer to that final glory of truth which each self-sacrificing act reveals in part. Look not outside thee nor beyond thee for the light and blessedness of truth, 
But look within, thou wilt find it within the narrow sphere of thy duty, even in the humble and hidden sacrifices of thine own heart. Sympathy. When thy gaze turns it on thine own soul, be most severe, but when it falls upon a fellow man, let kindliness control it, and refrain from that belittling censure that springs forth from common lips like weeds from marshy soil. Ella Wheeler Wilcox I do not ask the wounded person how he feels. I myself become the wounded person. Walt Whitman we can only sympathize with others in so far as we have conquered ourselves. We cannot think and feel for others while we are engaged in condoling with and pitying ourselves, cannot deal tenderly and lovingly with others while we are anxious for our own preeminence or for the exclusive preservation of ourselves, our opinions and our own generally. What is sympathy but thoughtfulness for others in the forgetfulness of self? To sympathize with others, we must first understand them, and to understand them, we must put away all personal preconceptions concerning them, and must see them as they are. We must enter into their inner state and become one with them, looking through their mental eyes and comprehending the range of their experience. You cannot, of course, do this with a being whose wisdom and experience are greater than your own, nor can you do it with any if you regard yourself as being on a higher plane than others, for egotism and sympathy cannot dwell together. But you can practice it with all those who are involved in sins and sufferings from which you have successfully extricated yourself, and though your sympathy cannot embrace and overshadow the man whose greatness is beyond you, yet you can place yourself in such an attitude towards him as to receive the protection of his larger sympathy, and so make for yourself an easier way out of the sins and sufferings by which you are still enchained. Prejudice and ill-will are complete barriers to the giving of sympathy, while pride and vanity are total barriers to its reception. You cannot sympathize with a person for whom you have conceived a hatred. You cannot enjoy the sympathy of one whom you envy. You cannot understand the person whom you dislike or he for whom through animal impulse you have framed an ill-formed affection. You do not cannot see him as he is, but see only your own imperfect notions of him, see only a distorted image of him through the exaggerating medium of your ill-grounded opinions. To see others as they are, you must not allow impulsive likes and dislikes, powerful prejudices or egotistic considerations to come between you and them. You must not resent their actions or condemn their beliefs and opinions. You must leave yourself entirely out and must, for the time being, assume their position. Only in this way can you become en rapport with them, and so fathom their life, their experience, and understand it. And when a man is understood, it becomes impossible to condemn him. Men misjudge, condemn, and avoid each other because they do not understand each other, and they do not understand each other because they have not overcome and purified themselves. Life is growth, development, evolution, and there is no essential distinction between the sinner and the saint. There is only a difference in degree. The saint was once a sinner. The sinner will one day be a saint. The sinner is the child. The saint is the grown man. He who separates himself from sinners, regarding them as wicked men to be avoided, is like a man avoiding contact with little children because they are unwise, disobedient, and play with toys. All life is one, but it has a variety of manifestations. The grown flower is not something distinct from the tree, it is a part of it, is only another form of leaf. Steam is not something apart from water, it is but another form of water, and in like manner good is transmuted evil. The saint is the sinner developed and transformed. The sinner is one whose understanding is undeveloped, and he ignorantly chooses wrong modes of action. The saint is one whose understanding is ripened, and he wisely chooses right modes of action. The sinner condemns the sinner, condemnation being a wrong mode of action. The saint never condemns the sinner, remembering that he himself formerly occupied the same place, but thinks of him with deep sympathy, regarding him in the light of a younger brother or a friend, 
for sympathy is a right and enlightened mode of action. The perfected saint who gives sympathy to all needs it of none, for he has transcended sin and suffering and lives in the enjoyment of lasting bliss. But all who suffer need sympathy, and all who sin must suffer. When a man comes to understand that every sin, whether of thought or deed, receives its just quota of suffering, he ceases to condemn and begins to sympathize, seeing the sufferings which sin entails, and he comes to such understanding by purifying himself. As a man purges himself of passions as he transmutes his selfish desires and puts underfoot his egotistic tendencies, he sounds the depths of all human experiences, all sins and sufferings and sorrows, all motives and thoughts and deeds, and comprehends the moral law in its perfection. Complete self-conquest is perfect knowledge, perfect sympathy, and he who views men with the stainless vision of a pure heart, views them with a pitying heart, sees them as a part of himself, not as something defiled and separate and distinct, but as his very self, sinning as he has sinned, suffering as he has suffered, sorrowing as he has sorrowed, yet withal glad in the knowledge that they will come, as he has come, to perfect peace at last. The truly good and wise man cannot be a passionate partisan, but extends his sympathy to all, seeing no evil in others to be condemned and resisted, but seeing the sin which is pleasant to the sinner, and the after-sorrow and pain which the sinner does not see, and when it overtakes him, does not understand. A man's sympathy extends just so far as his wisdom reaches, and no further, and a man only grows wiser as he grows tenderer and more compassionate. To narrow one's sympathy is to narrow one's heart, and so to darken and embitter one's life. To extend and broaden one's sympathy is to enlighten and gladden one's life, and to make plainer to others the way of light and gladness. To sympathize with another is to receive his being into our own, to become one with him, for unselfish love indissolubly unites, and he whose sympathy reaches out to and embraces all humankind and all living creatures has realized his identity and oneness with all, and comprehends the universal love and law and wisdom. Man is shut out from heaven and peace and truth only in so far as he shuts out others from his sympathy, where his sympathy ends, his darkness and torment and turmoils begin, for to shut others out from our love is to shut ourselves out from the blessedness of love and to become cramped in the dark prison of self. Whoever walks a furlong without sympathy walks to his own funeral dressed in a shroud. Only when one's sympathy is unlimited is the eternal light of truth revealed. Only in the love that knows no restriction is the boundless bliss enjoyed. Sympathy is bliss, in it is revealed the highest, purest blessedness. It is divine, for in its reciprocal light all thought of self is lost, and there remains only the pure joy of oneness with others, the ineffable communion of spiritual identity, where a man ceases to sympathize, he ceases to live, ceases to see and realize and know. One cannot truly sympathize with others until all selfish considerations concerning them are put away, and he who does this and strives to see others as they are, strives to realize their particular sins, temptations and sorrows, their beliefs, opinions and prejudices, comes at last to see exactly where they stand in their spiritual evolution, comprehends the arc of their experience, and knows that they cannot for the present act otherwise than they do. He sees that their thoughts and acts are prompted by the extent of their knowledge or their lack of knowledge, and that if they act blindly and foolishly, it is because their knowledge and experience are immature, and they can only come to act more wisely by gradual growth into more enlightened states of mind. He also sees that though this growth can be encouraged, helped and stimulated by the influence of a riper example, by seasonable words and well-timed instruction, it cannot be unnaturally forced. The flowers of love and wisdom must have time to grow, and the barren branches of hatred and folly cannot be all cut away at once. 
Such a man finds the doorway into the inner world of those with whom he comes in contact, and he opens it and enters in, and dwells with them in the hidden and sacred sanctuary of their being, and he finds nothing to hate, nothing to revile, nothing to condemn in that sacred place, but something to love and tend, and in his own heart room only for greater pity, greater patience, greater love. He sees that he is one with them, that they are but another aspect of himself, that their natures are not different from his own, except in modification and degree, but are identical with it. If they are acting out certain sinful tendencies, he has but to look within to find the same tendencies in himself, albeit perhaps restrained or purified. If they are manifesting certain holy and divine qualities, he finds the same pure spirit within himself, though perhaps in a lesser degree of power and development. One touch of nature makes the whole world kin. The sin of one is the sin of all. The virtue of one is the virtue of all. No man can be separate from another. There is no difference of nature but only difference of condition. If a man thinks he is separated from another by virtue of his superior holiness, he is not so separated, and his darkness and delusion are very great. Humanity is one, and in the holy sanctuary of sympathy saint and sinner meet and unite. It is said of Jesus that he took upon himself the sins of the whole world, that is, he identified himself with those sins, and did not regard himself as essentially separate from sinners, but as being of a like nature with them, and his realization of his oneness with all men was manifested in his life as profound sympathy with those who, for their deep sins, were avoided and cast off by others. And who is it that is in the greatest need of sympathy? Not the saint, not the enlightened seer, not the perfect man. It is the sinner, the unenlightened man, the imperfect one, and the greater the sin, the greater is the need. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance, is the statement of one who comprehended all human needs. The righteous man does not need your sympathy, but the unrighteous. He who, by his wrongdoing, is laying up for himself long periods of suffering and woe, is in need of it. The flagrantly unrighteous man is condemned, despised, and avoided by those who are living in a similar condition to himself, though for the time being they may not be subject to his particular form of sin, for that withholding of sympathy and that mutual condemnation which are so rife is the commonest manifestation of that lack of understanding in which all sin takes its rise. While a man is involved in sin, he will condemn others who are likewise involved, and the deeper and greater his sin, the more severe will be his condemnation of others. It is only when a man begins to sorrow for his sin, and so to rise above it into the clearer light of purity and understanding, that he ceases from condemning others and learns to sympathize with them. But this ceaseless condemnation of each other by those who are involved in the fierce play of the passions must needs be for it one of the modes of operation of the great law which universally and eternally obtains, and the unrighteous one who falls under the condemnation of his fellows will the more rapidly reach a higher and nobler condition of heart and life if he humbly accepts the censure of others as the effect of his own sin and resolves henceforward to refrain from all condemnation of others. The truly good and wise man condemns none, having put away all blind passion and selfishness, he lives in the calm regions of love and peace, and understands all modes of sin with their consequent sufferings and sorrows. Enlightened and awakened, freed from all selfish bias, and seeing men as they are, his heart responds in holy sympathy with all. Should any condemn, abuse, or slander him, he throws around them the kindly protection of his sympathy, seeing the ignorance which prompts them so to act, and knowing that they alone will suffer for their wrong acts. Learn by self-conquest and the acquisition of wisdom to love him whom you now condemn, to sympathize with those who condemn you. Turn your eyes away from their condemnation and search your own heart to find, perchance, some hard, unkind, or wrong thoughts, which, when discovered and understood, you will condemn yourself. 
Much that is commonly called sympathy is personal affection. To love them who love us is human bias and inclination, but to love them who do not love us is divine sympathy. Sympathy is needed because of the prevalence of suffering, for there is no being or creature who has not suffered. Through suffering, sympathy is evolved. Not in a year or a life or an age is the human heart purified and softened by suffering, but after many lives of intermittent pain, after many ages of ever-recurring sorrow, man reaps the golden harvest of his experiences and garners in the rich, ripe sheaves of love and wisdom, and then he understands and understanding, he sympathizes. All suffering is the result of ignorantly violated law, and after many repetitions of the same wrong act and the same kind of suffering resulting from that act, knowledge of the law is acquired and the higher state of obedience and wisdom is reached. Then there blossoms the pure and perfect flower of sympathy. One aspect of sympathy is that of pity, pity for the distressed or pain-stricken with a desire to alleviate or help them bear their sufferings. The world needs more of this divine quality. For pity makes the world soft to the weak and noble for the strong. But it can only be developed by eradicating all hardness and unkindness, all accusation and resentment. He who, when he sees another suffering for his sin, hardens his heart and thinks or says, it serves him right. Such a one cannot exercise pity nor apply its healing balm. Every time a man acts cruelly towards another, be it only a dumb creature, or refuses to bestow needed sympathy, he dwarfs himself, deprives himself of ineffable blessedness, and prepares himself for suffering. Another form of sympathy is that of rejoicing with those who are more successful than ourselves, as though their success were our own. Blessed indeed is he who is free from all envy and malice, and can rejoice and be glad when he hears of the good fortune of those who regard him as an enemy. The protecting of creatures weaker and more indefensible than oneself is another form in which this divine sympathy is manifested. The helpless frailty of the dumb creation calls for the exercise of the deepest sympathy. The glory of superior strength resides in its power to shield, not to destroy. Not by the callous of destruction of weaker things is life truly lived, but by their preservation. All life is linked and kin, and the lowest creature is not separated from the highest but by greater weakness, by lesser intelligence. When we pity and protect, we reveal and enlarge the divine life and joy within ourselves. When we thoughtlessly or callously inflict suffering or destroy, then our divine life becomes obscured and its joy fades and dies. Bodies may feed bodies and passions passions, but man's divine nature is only nurtured, sustained, and developed by kindness, love, sympathy, and all pure and unselfish acts. By bestowing sympathy on others, we increase our own. Sympathy given can never be wasted. Even the meanest creature will respond to its heavenly touch, for it is the universal language which all creatures understand. I have recently heard a true story of a Dartmoor convict whose terms of incarceration in various convict stations extended to over forty years. As a criminal, he was considered one of the most callous and hopelessly abandoned, and the warders found him almost intractable. But one day he caught a mouse, a weak, terrified, hunted thing like himself, and its helpless frailty and the similarity of its condition with his own appealed to him and started into flame the divine spark of sympathy which smouldered in his crime-hardened heart and which no human touch had ever wakened into life. He kept the mouse in an old boot in his cell, fed, tended, and loved it, and in his love for the weak and helpless he forgot and lost his hatred for the strong. His heart and his hand were no longer against his fellows. He became tractable and obedient to the uttermost, the warders could not understand his change. It seemed to them little short of miraculous that this most hardened of all criminals should suddenly be transformed into the likeness of a gentle, obedient child. Even the expression of his features altered remarkably. A pleasing smile began to play around the mouth, 
which had formerly been moved to nothing better than a cruel grin, and the implacable hardness of his eyes disappeared and gave place to a soft, deep, mellow light. The criminal was a criminal no longer. He was saved, converted, clothed and in his right mind, restored to humaneness and to humanity, and set firmly on the pathway to divinity by pitying and caring for a defenceless creature. All this was made known to the warders shortly afterwards, when, on his discharge, he took the mouse away with him. Thus sympathy bestowed increases its store in our own hearts and enriches and fructifies our own life. Sympathy given is blessedness received. Sympathy withheld is blessedness forfeited. In the measure that a man increases and enlarges his sympathy so much nearer does he approach the ideal life, the perfect blessedness, and when his heart has become so mellowed that no hard, bitter or cruel thought can enter and detract from its permanent sweetness, then indeed is he richly and divinely blessed. Forgiveness. If men only understood all the emptiness and acting of the sleeping and the waking, of the souls they judge so blindly, of the hearts they pierce so unkindly, they, with gentler words and feeling, would apply the balm of healing, if they only understood. Kindness, nobler ever than revenge. Shakespeare The remembering of injuries is spiritual darkness. The fostering of resentment is spiritual suicide. To resort to the spirit and practice of forgiveness is the beginning of enlightenment. It is also the beginning of peace and happiness. There is no rest for him who broods over slights and injuries and wrongs, no quiet repose of mind for him who feels that he has been unjustly treated and who schemes how best to act for the discomfiture of his enemy. How can happiness dwell in a heart that is so disturbed by ill will? Do birds resort to a burning bush wherein to build and sing? Neither can happiness inhabit in that breast that is aflame with burning thoughts of resentment. Nor can wisdom come and dwell where such folly resides. Revenge seems sweet only to the mind that is unacquainted with the spirit of forgiveness. But when the sweetness of forgiveness is tasted, then the extreme bitterness of revenge is known. Revenge seems to lead to happiness to those who are involved in the darkness of passion, but when the violence of passion is abandoned and the mildness of forgiveness is restored to, then it is seen that revenge leads to suffering. Revenge is a virus which eats into the very vitals of the mind and poisons the entire spiritual being. Resentment is a mental fever which burns up the wholesome energies of the mind, and taking offense is a form of moral sickness which saps the healthy flow of kindliness and goodwill, and from which men and women should seek to be delivered. The unforgiving and resentful spirit is a source of great suffering and sorrow, and he who harbors and encourages it, who does not overcome and abandon it, forfeits much blessedness and does not obtain any measure of true enlightenment. To be hard-hearted is to suffer, is to be deprived of light and comfort. To be tender-hearted is to be serenely glad, is to receive light and be well comforted. It will seem strange to many to be told that the hard-hearted and unforgiving suffer most. Yet it is profoundly true, for not only do they, by the law of attraction, draw to themselves the revengeful passions in other people, but their hardness of heart itself is a continual source of suffering. Every time a man hardens his heart against a fellow being, he inflicts upon himself five kinds of suffering, namely the suffering of loss of love, the suffering of lost communion and fellowship, the suffering of a troubled and confused mind, the suffering of wounded passion or pride, and the suffering of punishment inflicted by others. Every act of unforgiveness entails upon the doer of that act these five sufferings, whereas every act of forgiveness brings to the doer five kinds of blessedness, the blessedness of love, the blessedness of increased communion and fellowship, the blessedness of a calm and peaceful mind, the blessedness of passion stilled and pride overcome, and the blessedness and kindness and goodwill bestowed by others. 
Numbers of people are today suffering the fiery torments of an unforgiving spirit, and only when they make an effort to overcome that spirit can they know what a cruel and exacting taskmaster they are serving. Only those who have abandoned the service of such a master for that of the nobler master of forgiveness can realize and know how grievous a service is the one, how sweet the other. Let a man contemplate the strife of the world, how individuals and communities, neighbors and nations, live in continual retaliations towards each other. Let him realize the heartaches, the bitter tears, the grievous partings and misunderstandings, yea, even the bloodshed and woe which spring from that strife, and thus realizing he will never again yield to ignoble thoughts of resentment, never again take offense at the actions of others, never again live in unforgiveness towards any being. Have good will to all that lives, letting unkindness die, and greed and wrath, so that your lives be made like soft airs passing by. When a man abandons retaliation for forgiveness, he passes from darkness to light. So dark and ignorant is unforgiveness that no being who is at all wise or enlightened could descend to it, but its darkness is not understood and known until it is left behind, and the better and nobler course of conduct is sought and practiced. Man is blinded and deluded only by his own dark and sinful tendencies, and the giving up of all unforgiveness means the giving up of pride and certain forms of passion, the abandonment of the deeply rooted idea of the importance of one's self and of the necessity for protecting and defending that self. And when that is done, the higher life, greater wisdom and pure enlightenment, which pride and passion completely obscured, are revealed in all their light and beauty. Then there are petty offences, little spites and passing slights, which, while of a less serious nature than deep-seated hatreds and revenges, dwarf the character and cramp the soul. They are due to the sin of self and self-importance and thrive on vanity. Whosoever is blinded and deluded by vanity will continually see something in the actions and the attitudes of others towards him at which to take offence, and the more there is of vanity, the more greatly will the imaginary slight or wrong be exaggerated. Moreover, to live in the frequent indulgence of petty resentments increase the spirit of hatred and leads gradually downward to greater darkness, suffering and self-delusion. Don't take offense or allow your feelings to be hurt, which means get rid of pride and vanity. Don't give occasion for offense or hurt the feelings of others, which means be gently considerate, forgiving and charitable towards all. The not taking offense and the not giving offense go together. When a man ceases to resent the actions of others, he is already acting kindly towards them, considering them before himself or his own defense. Such a man will be gently in what he says and does, will arouse love and kindness in others, and not stir them up to ill will and strife. He will also be free from all fear concerning the actions of others towards him, for he who hurts none fears none. But the unforgiving man, he who is eager to pay back some real or imaginary slight or injury, will not be considerate towards others, for he considers himself first and is continually making enemies. He also loves in the fear of others, thinking that that they are trying to do towards him as he is doing towards them. He who contrives the hurt of others fears others. There is a beautiful story of Prince Dirgayu, which was told by an ancient Indian teacher to his disciples in order to impress them with the truth of the sublime percept that hatred ceases not by hatred at any time. Hatred ceases by not hatred. The story is as follows. Brahmadatta, a powerful king of Benares, made war upon Dirgeti, the king of Kosala, in order to annex his kingdom, which was much smaller than his own. Dirgeti, seeing that it was impossible for him to resist the greater power of Brahmadatta, fled and left his kingdom in his enemy's hands. For some time he wandered from place to place in disguise, and at last settled down with his queen in an artisan's cottage, and the queen gave birth to a son whom they called Dirgayu. 
Now King Brahmadatta was anxious to discover the hiding place of Dirgeti in order to put to death the conquered king, for he thought, Seeing that I have deprived him of his kingdom, he may someday treacherously kill me if I do not kill him. But many years passed away, and Dirgeti devoted himself to the education of his son, who by diligent application became learned and skillful and wise. And after a time, Dilgeti's secret became known, and he, fearing that Brahmadatta would discover him and slay all three, and thinking more of the life of his son than his own, sent away the prince. Soon after the exile king fell into the hands of Brahmadatta and was, along with his queen, executed. Now Brahmadatta thought, I have got rid of Dilgeti and his queen, but their son, Prince Dilgayu, lives, and he will be sure to contrive some means of effecting my assassination, yet he is unknown to any, and I have no means of discovering him. So the king lived in great fear and continual distress of mind. Soon after the execution of his parents, Dirgayu, under an assumed name, sought employment in the king's stables and was engaged by the master of elephants. Dirgayu quickly endeared himself to all, and his superior abilities came at last under the notice of the king, who had the young man brought before him and was so charmed with him that he employed him in his own castle, and he proved to be so able and diligent that the king shortly placed him in a position of great trust under himself. One day the king went on a long hunting expedition and became separated from his retinue, Dirgayu alone remaining with him and the king, being fatigued with his exertions, lay down and slept with his head in Dirgayu's lap. Then Dirgayu thought, This king has greatly wronged me. He robbed my father of his kingdom and slew my parents, and he is now entirely in my power. And he drew his sword, thinking to slay Brahmadatta, but remembering how his father had taught him never to seek revenge but to forgive to the uttermost, he sheathed his sword. At last the king awoke out of a disturbed sleep, and the youth inquired of him why he looked so frightened. My sleep, said the king, is always restless, for I frequently dream that I am in the power of young Dirgayu, and that he is alone to slay me. While lying here I again dream that with greater vividness than ever before, and it has filled me with dread and terror. Then the youth, drawing his sword, said, I am Prince Dirgayu, and you are in my power, the time of vengeance has arrived. Then the king fell upon his knees and begged Dirgayu to spare his life, and Dirgayu said, It is you, O king, who must spare my life. For many years you have wished to find me in order that you might kill me, and now that you have found me, let me beg of you to grant me my life. And there and then did Brahmadatta and Dirgayu grant each other life, took hands, and solemnly vowed never to harm each other. And so overcome was the king by the noble and forgiving spirit of Dugayu that he gave him his daughter in marriage and restored to him his father's kingdom. Thus hatred ceases by not hatred, by forgiveness, which is very beautiful and is sweeter and more effective than revenge. It is the beginning of love, of that divine love that does not seek its own, and he who practices it, who perfects himself in it, comes at last to realize that blessed state wherein the torments of pride and vanity and hatred and retaliation are forever dispelled, and goodwill and peace are unchanging and unlimited. And there and then did Brahmadatta and Dirgayu grant each other life, took hands, and solemnly vowed never to harm each other. And so overcome was the king by the noble and forgiving spirit of Dirgayu that he gave him his daughter in marriage and restored to him his father's kingdom. Thus hatred ceases by not hatred, by forgiveness, which is very beautiful and is sweeter and more effective than revenge. It is the beginning of love, of that divine love that does not seek its own, and he who practices it, who perfects himself in it, comes at last to realize that blessed state wherein the torments of pride and vanity and hatred and retaliation are forever dispelled, and goodwill and peace are unchanging and unlimited. In that state of calm, silent bliss, 
even forgiveness passes away and is no longer needed, for he who has reached it sees no evil to resent, but only ignorance and delusion on which to have compassion, and forgiveness is only needed so long as there is any tendency to resent, retaliate, and take offense. Equal love towards all is the perfect law, the perfect state in which all lesser states find their completion. Forgiveness is one of the doorways in the faultless temple of love divine.